So I really enjoy the paper. Let me just uh, load up the slides. Um, one second. So let me just start while uh, the slides are coming. So basically, what I liked about this paper is it's a really uh, innovative idea to think a little bit about what are some of the ways that we can try and pick out these amenities that we've been talking about a lot in urban models, and what can we look for that might sort of be an am amenity that could be perfect, could be uh, something that we could see in the data, that we could then see if we can look and find if people seem to be taking this into account where they're choosing where to live. So what this paper does is it thinks about uh, trying to find evidence that in a world where people are choosing to move between cities based on the attributes of those cities, does it look like people are factoring in the shape of the city, and perhaps this is reasonable because it could affect the commuting time, when they're thinking about what city to live in. Okay, and so the model uh, is a model that's really thinking about this being an attribute of a city that people are going to take into account when they choose where to live. Okay, so commuting, just to kind of give a sense of what people spend their time doing, uh, so in London, it looks like, on average, people spend about 40, close to 40 minutes. For example, in Los Angeles, it looks like about 30 minutes per day. There is sort of a lo lots of differences across cities. I couldn't find any data for Indian cities exactly on commuting, but there is sort of a gradient across cities of the world. But it seems that on average, people spend around 30 to 40 minutes. Here in Shanghai, people are spending 50 minutes on their average one-way commute. Okay, so in the, in the model, what we've just done, I'll go through very quickly, but basically a city has a wage, it has an amenity bundle, and it has a housing price. People are going to compare different cities based on these three attributes. They're then going to choose where to move. There's, of course, going to be the housing market clearing and the firm market clearing. So what we're going to think of is city size here is just one of these amenities. We're going to look at how, over time, the city size is changing. Do people seem to be responding? in the way that we would think of if it was a consumption uh, amenity. And we're going to do that by using, uh, similar to the SAIS instruments, for thinking about housing elasticities depending on geographical constraints. Here, housing or geographical constraints are going to constrain how a city can expand. Okay, and so basically the model, I think, is quite, it's quite straightforward and it's quite nice. Depending on whether or not we th think that these were on the consumption side or the productivity side, we should think about a worsening uh, city shape, decreasing the population, perhaps increasing the wage if it's on the consumption side, if it's on the production side, perhaps decreasing the wage, and uh, it's going to be cheaper to live there because you have a less pleasant uh, environment. And this is uh, what is found, and it seems that the set of results are consistent with this being a consumption, consumption amenity. So, you know, just a kind of benchmark at the end, like these, are, these effects seem to be relatively large. So, Going an extra 360 meters each way, uh, that's an extra 220 kilometers per year. This is a 5% cost of uh, income if we think about opportunity cost of time. At walking speed, we'll get about halfway there. If you're driving your car, you'll get, get about a quarter of the way there. If you're taking other public transport, it would be less because it's going to be faster, but also cheaper. So what I want to think about, or what I want to talk about, is that I think it's a really interesting uh, idea to think about this. But what I think is uh, perhaps equally as interesting, and perhaps this could be something to think about for the next paper, uh, is what happens uh, within the city. Uh, okay, the pictures are really not clear. Basically, here are three cities. This is Delhi, uh, this is Mumbai, and then for comparison, this is London. Uh, so I don't know if you can see it all. This is basically, uh, Delhi is a city, you can see it's relatively unconstrued. It's uh, one of these cities that's going to have good city shape. It's going to be a city that can grow, there's not a lot of mountains or anything here. This is Mumbai, and this is also the example that we had in the, the slides. You can see it's here, there's a lot of water around, it's going to be a city that's going to be very constrained. This is London, which again is a city that's got perhaps space and it's going to be more circular in how it can spread out. Uh, by the way, these pictures are from uh, Urban Observatory. Okay, what is it, what, how does population density change inside a city? So this is sort of one thing I want to think a little bit about here is that this idea of city size of being an amenity should be something that perhaps matters across cities, but it's equally going to matter for where within a city people are living. And is there some way that we can think about using this idea of city shape to then go and try to 
test or think about whether or not the model that we could write down that would have finer predictions within the city is also informative or helps to benchmark what we get when we're thinking about people moving across the city. So again here, it's, sorry, it's a little hard to see. Basically, the brightest uh, yellow is the highest density people, so 30 to 150,000 people per square kilometer. This is Dali. Uh, so you can see there's a bunch of uh, yellow and then less densely populated. Here, this is Mumbai. You can see there's a lot of high density populated areas down here. So it's also going to be where the kind of commercial area of the city is. But there's uh, people who are also highly densely populated up here, spread out a little bit here. This is London. So if the other London has a lot of people, the density actually comparatively is not that high. So you can see that there's specks of bright yellow right around the city center, but overall it's a little less densely populated. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, you have to take my word for it. This is uh, the land area within each of these cities that's zoned to be commercial. So what I wanted to think a little bit about here is it's also going to be the case that you can't have commercial land, and I think this came up already when we are talking about rezoning or thinking about areas in the center of the city, if it's going to be the case that there are a lot of physical factories or physical commercial properties there, it's not going to be the case that people can be living directly there. So what kind of patterns or what sort of things look like how these different cities might choose about where to allocate the commercial property. So what I wanted to sort of show you here is that, uh, again in Delhi, it's relatively spread out. And so it looks, this is London, it's all quite concentrated here. And then here again in uh, Mumbai, you can see there's a big concentration here in the south uh, around sort of the harbor. Okay, and then uh, sort of how could governments respond to the city shape that they have? One of the sort of responses is obviously going to be on roads. But this is just to give an, illustrated sh as an illustration again of how these three cities have dealt with this issue. So here is uh, Delhi. You can see there's a, this is a city that has a sort of circular shape. So you can have a road network that's going through the city that's going to make it even. It's got a favorable shape, but there's also a road network that makes it relatively easy to get around. Here is the case of Mumbai. You can see the geographical constraints are also going to have some implications for where you can put roads, how easily people can move around. And then this is uh, what happens in London. You can see the sort of ring road around the outside. So this gives people easily access into this area here. And then once you're here, you can travel usually on public transport and such. OK, so why, did it, why might it be important or why might, might it be interesting? And here I think what you could do very easily is think about the model that you write down for why people think on average they should take into account commuting times. And then think a little bit more about exactly where in the city do people end up. And this might be important, especially for thinking about people who are migrating in or out, who may be more or less likely to end up in high or low income jobs, or who are going to end up in high locations or not. So on average, this is some data from Brazil. And actually, Brazil might be a case that you could look at, because I think you can get both the rent data plus the commuting time data. So you might be able to do something here in this case at a very small level. Uh, but what you can look at here is, for example, on average, what do the commute times look like? So here, this is the average. So taking Rio de Janeiro, for example. Uh, okay. These are not my tables. So I want to do Rio because the average looks above the lowest and the highest. So I'll take another one where the average looks in the middle. <laughs> Let's take um, Belo Horizonte. Here, the average seems no, to be... Lowest, it's richest and poorest. So it's not always nice. It doesn't, it doesn't need to, right? Well, okay. Yeah, but it seems that, okay. I'll believe that this is the average, and the richest and poorest, okay. The average is about 42, and the richest and poorest in this case don't seem to be too different. Uh, but you can see in other cities, there's a lot of dispersion, even within a city, of how much commuting time people have to make based on where they live. Here is the share of commute to travel longer than one hour each way, each one way. And again, what you can sort of see is that some places have a lot of heterogeneity here. So taking Rio de Janeiro, uh, the richest DSL, about 10% of those guys are traveling one hour per way, one way. For the poorest guys, they're tra close to 20% of those guys are traveling one way. And the reason I think this is really interesting is that when you would write down a model of exactly within the city variation, you would get these sort of predictions on people trading off how far away they are versus their opportunity cost of time versus the housing price that they have to pay. And this would be what you would get in a sort of standard monocentric model. So for example, the model that Saiz writes down actually has exactly this cost of traveling over time as well as how far away you are. I think here you could think about city size is going to be perhaps affecting both of these. It's going to be changing the relative distances that you might have to travel within the city. And it's also plausible that for the same amount of distance, it's going to be changing the per unit cost that you sort of travel around. 
And from this, you end up getting housing supply equations that <coughs> let you think about how to exactly compute the mean. Uh, the mean is going to be one sort of summary statistic of a city, but I think there's going to be a lot of information also on what else is going on uh, sort of across space. And I think this might be particularly interesting for thinking about exactly what happens for migrants coming in. So one thing I did like about the paper is that they did, there were some really interesting robustness tests. For example, thinking about rent control and thinking about, for example, thinking about uh, just dropping houses at the lower end of the distribution and just thinking about high rent locations. But it could also be interesting to think about if there's a lot of rent control, that means that people are not going to be moving away from houses that might be very geographically favorable. It might be that that means that the type of houses that are available for people moving in are either going to be ones that are more expensive or ones that are less geographically available. And so the marginal new migrant or new person getting a house might have a very different housing rent than the average person who's already in there, especially if there are issues such as rent control. So what I think this all sort of sums up is that it's really interesting to think about city sizes and amenity, and it's really interesting to think about how, on average, the expected commute could affect the decisions about where to choose to locate when you're choosing, at a macro level, what city to be in. But equally, it should have really interesting implications for thinking, once you've chosen that city, where inside the city you're going to work, and how does that gradient trade off between the wages that people face and the commuting times that they face within location. And so here I think it's really a data issue. If there was a, and that's why I think it might be sort of a, a sort of paper to think about if there's another setting sort of to take the same idea and think a little bit more in detail. And here I think Brazil could be possibly a really good one to look at, where you think about exactly the same trade-off, but then thinking about on the margin, what are people doing once they get to a place, and how, how, are, these, uh, how are these decisions being made, and what sort of, for example, gra gradient of rent to commuting distance do you find inside a city, does that seem to then be matching up the correlations or what you would ex get with the migration utility on average to the city? And then I think that's also nice because we could benchmark these within city commuting costs also to what we think about with the cost of moving across space sort of from A to B as well. And then sort of as a last thought, you know, the model in itself, there's nothing that kind of makes it any different for this to be a thing in India than it would be for the US. And exactly the same sort of trade-offs uh, are exactly perhaps in play. Perhaps people have more likely to have private transport, perhaps there's better uh, transportation networks. But, you know, and I think this is sort of a fair comment to say for lots of the pro papers, uh, our paper included as well, what is it exactly that makes these sort of issues, are they a bit, or are they different in developing countries than they are in developed countries? In which ways are they, are they different? Is it something about, for the same physical constraint, there's less infrastructure in transportation, there's less uh, public transportation? You know, are there correlations, uh, for example, the paper we see this afternoon, which is going to talk about how some of these aggregate correlations change <laughs> over space based on the sort of level of development of a country. And, you know, what do we think that this is something that is a problem everywhere in the world? Is it just a ra or is it relatively more of a problem, especially in developing countries where cities may not be as, as well planned out? So, sort of in sum, I really liked the project and I think it's a really interesting idea and it would be great to sort of perhaps keep going and see if there's also some way to see how much, if there's any way to get a little bit more out of this by looking at, uh, even finer at these sort of choices. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And you want to come up? Uh, <laughs> uh, questions? Do you like that? Thank you for what Melanie was mentioning in the discussion. It would be really interesting if you could, uh, so you find that the bad shape impacts mainly through the amenities term inside the model. It would be really interesting to try to microfound that in a whole community inside city and sort of see, could you explain all of the amenity effects you're estimating in the data purely through the mechanism of commuting? Or is this something left over? I think it would be really interesting. That would also be interesting because the community model will tell you what the right shape metric is, right? Because it's just the model itself will tell you what the right sort of statistic is and how it inside the city. Oh, should yeah, I answer? Just, just remember, the writing that works with the cop less is you want to do the commuting being multiplicated in time. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. You can't do it. That's, that's good. You, I, was, I was working it out actually while you were talking. Oh, okay. Like the, uh, <laughs> so should I answer now or one at a time? So I just want to make one. So thank you for the, for the great discussion. Um, so one theme that came out of that is r related to your point is that it would be interesting to look 
um, more closely at what happens within cities and what the implications are in terms of uh, city shape and the spatial equilibrium within rather than across cities. Uh, these are all great ideas and definitely something that I want to work on. But right now, the major, ch the, the big challenge I'm facing is data availability. So for in this context, it's really hard to find data at the subsidy level. Um, I don't even know at the moment what the, dis what the um, uh, population density gradient looks like because I don't have information on um, the distribution of population within cities. Uh, and data on housing prices w at the subsidy level seems to be even harder um, to obtain. Right now, the only data I have at the subsidy level is just this cross-section of firms' addresses. I'm hopeful that I might be able to get some more information uh, using census data. The census gives you some um, variables defined at the ward level. Uh, and using that, it might be possible to um, to get at some of these ideas. Like in general, I think it's it's a great point. But but, but, but Steve's yeah. comment doesn't require any more data. All it requires the is model. You but might, you might put down the thing and then oh. you assume that you're throwing away, throwing away some share of the land, essentially. So that that yields a very very tight, precise implication of what this will what this will do, which is easy for you to do, and, and will tell you whether or not that model. Can but I would be only able to test some of the predictions of a richer model sure. with the data. And that's what I meant. Yeah. So, so, so I, of course, I understand that having a bad shape, you know, it's kind of a negative, of, negative amenity in the sense that it uh, increases average commuting distances. But then at the same time, a lot of these obstacles that you may face as you grow, uh, some of them may be good, some of them may be bad, right? If you hit water, maybe that's a positive amenity. If you hit the mountain, that may be a negative amenity. And so I was wondering, uh, you know, in, in some sense, there's going to be heterogeneity across these bad shapes. But depending on what exactly these obstacles are that you hit, uh, they may actually uh, make it an even worse negative amenity or it may mitigate the effect. And I was sort of wondering whether one can think about this a little bit more uh, carefully and maybe classify uh, different types of uh, obstacles that these cities, uh, n natural or geographic obstacles that these cities hit? Uh, right. I think this, like another way to frame maybe this question is that one of the threats to identification is the fact that, geom that, sorry, that ge uh, geographic obstacles have some inherent amenity or disamenity value, right? Um, so um, to the, the time invariant effect of being, say, a coastal city or a mountainous city, that would be captured by the city fixed effects. It doesn't solve the problem because we might worry that it's time varying, of course. Um, so in, in, in one of my robustness checks, when I drop all coastal cities and all mountainous cities, I'm trying in part to address this concern that maybe what I'm picking up is some direct um, value of geography. And we might not even know necessarily in what direction it goes, right? Because the coast could be a, a positive consumption amenity. So so we don't know, right? Uh, to the extent that we think that some of these, these geographic constraints are, are bad, um, then it would tend to go, um, sorry, that these geographic constraints are, are good, like the coast it has some direct um, consumption amenity value, it would tend to go against my finding that more constrained cities have, um, have lower rents. But in general, I think it's, it's a fair point. It is a threat to the identification, the fact that geography does other things. Uh, well, I just have. Oh, sorry. I don't think you should worry as much about it in this in this context as in the U.S. I mean, certainly the available evidence on climate and growth, for example, mm -hmm. in India or climate prices shows vastly weaker, if negligible, effects relative to the U.S. stuff. So, whereas Americans are, you know, in a wealthy nation, people are happy to move around in response to these things. At lower levels of income, these these things can appear to be much less. So much those powerful. would be luxury a goods. Nice, a nice climate is a luxury. <laughs> okay. Good. It's 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 clearly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just going to add one. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add one more comment on something that uh, then Melanie brought up. Um, uh, roads, the road infrastructure. Um, so there's one set of results in the paper that I skipped here due to time constraints that tries to look at how the current road network is explained by shape. Um, and right now I'm just looking at road density. Um, and I, I basically what I'm trying to look at is whether cities that have worse shapes, sorry, if in, in cities that have worse shapes, people are being compensated with a more dense road network a denser road network, and it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, one, um, more, one richer exercise I could do would be to look at uh, the spatial properties of a road network in addition to just road density. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>